time. She also has a background in chemistry and uh, is pretty knowledgeable of the chemical uh, nature of these experiences as well. Um, she's a faculty here at CIS. Uh, she's also one of the co-founders of Erie um, and is part of the officers of the nonprofit. So it's pretty exciting. We're going to be working side to side for quite some time. Uh, Erie, or excuse me, Natalie brings just uh, such a joy and such a knowledge to our community. It's really awesome to have her be a part of it. Uh, not only just from a naturopathic or a chem chemistry perspective, but ethnobotany. I mean, she could walk through the forest and tell you uh, what you need for what ailment, and it's really awesome to be connected with her. Uh, I'm also privileged. Enough to be able to live with her, so it's nice because these conversations continue into the night and they get deeper and deeper and deeper as the time goes on, so that's pretty awesome. Um, today, Natalie's going to talk a little bit about uh, the Mazatec tradition. Uh, she recently uh, journeyed down to Mexico this summertime and was able to spend some time with Julieta, who's one of the 13 indigenous grandmothers. So uh, she has a, really, not a lot of really nice stories about that. And uh, it's really a tradition that we should be knowledgeable of as we're here talking about the 920 Coalition and mushrooms, because that's the tradition where it comes from. So without further ado, unless the PDFs don't work, here we go, Natalie, Dr. Natalie. Thank you, Larry. It is truly a blessing that not only do we get to do a bunch of really cool stuff together, but we live together. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, let's see if, yeah, I hope this is going to work. Great. All right, we're going to do the best we can with a PDF. Uh, sorry, we won't have fancy transitions uh, tonight, but just what it is. Okay, so... My name is Dr. Natalie. As Larry said, I am faculty here at CIIS. I teach in the Integrative Health Studies program, and I am honored to be a founding member of Erie. Erie was born of a dream and a conversation and a semester of a class together where several of us were sitting um, in class with Susana Bustos, who's a professor here in an entheogenic shamanism course. And we were very interested in keeping the conversation going and figuring out how we could continue to talk about all this material that we were studying and really passionate about, and thus was born ERI, which stands for Entheogenic Research, Integration, and Education. And as Larry told you earlier, we have several fronts for moving forward and really wanting to give people an opportunity to be educated about all things entheogenic and to support people who want to do scholarly research, um, empirical research. We can't so much directly uh, support that uh, openly. Um, and we also want to support people to have conversations and a place to talk about the integration process so that when you have an entheogenic experience, you can bring the material home with you and make meaning of it in a way that is ultimately beneficial for you. Many members. Today, of technical difficulties, folks, so no worries. It's all good. We're just uh, buzzing. Here we go. Great. Okay. So I entitled my talk, Magic and Mystery in the Mazatec Mountains. And as Larry said, I spent some time this summer in the highlands of um, Oaxaca. How many people know where the state of Oaxaca is in Mexico? Okay, great. I'll show you a map too because, you know, not all of us do. Um, here's Mexico. And Oaxaca is the state that is colored in green. It's in the southern part of Mexico, um, kind of where it becomes a peninsula leading into the rest of uh, Central America. And we spent time at mostly where you see that red star up in the center there in Huautla de Jimenez. Uh, we flew into o Oaxaca City and then took a bus appropriately for about five to six hours. Um, that along the way, the drive shaft of the bus just completely fell off. That was an interesting <laughs> experience. Um, but what do you do? You just basically pull over, which in our case, we happened to have the drive shaft fall off right across from a mechanic. So that was convenient. Um, it was starting to get dark. They managed to go find the screws or whatever we needed. We gave them enough headlamps and hoped for the best. And they fixed the vehicle and we just kept cruising on windy, foggy mountain roads to Huautla de Jimenez. It was quite a journey to say the least. Um, this is the relatively new sign that helps to welcome you to Huautla. Um, and, oh, I'm so sorry, you can't really see this at all, can you? Let's see, what's happening here? Oh, God. Well, okay. What you can't see is that there are mushrooms on the sign welcoming you there. Um, is there anything we can do about the um, quality of the darkness or lightness, Larry, you think? All right. It's, we'll just... 
Okay, well, my main reason in going to Wautla was to work with this woman, Julieta Casimiro, um, who is one of the 13 grandmothers. Uh, she is truly a legend. She is 78 years old. She's been doing mushroom work for, I don't know, 40, 50 years, good, good chunk of her life. Um, she's amazing. And she uh, does not come directly from the lineage of Maria Sabino, but kind of a side lineage. Um, she was married to, she is, or was married to a man named Lucio, whose mother's name was Regina Carrera, and she, um, she was a cousin of Maria Sabina. And so she learned from Maria, but carried and brought other things into her lineage as well. Um, there is a picture of Julieta. Um, she's kind of uh, fourth from the right, and she's in her traditional Mazatec uh, garb with the 13 grandmothers. And there's another picture of her making a water offering at a ceremony, and this this beautiful um, these beautiful clo uh, pieces of clothes that they wear. And um, you'll see as we go on. There's a very interesting blending of elements of different cultures, and uh, primarily Catholicism, Christianity, and the traditional Mazatec way. So it's pretty amazing how um, all of these, for me, seemingly different ways have come to being and harmony there in the highlands. Um, making offerings is very important. Giving offerings and receiving gifts, this is part of the culture there. So it's not just about hey, we want to go study with Julieta, let's show up and hopefully get to eat some mushrooms with her. It's like, what can we bring? What can be our offering? What can be our offering to the land, to the culture, to the people there? Um, you can't see this. This is me giving Julieta. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not realizing as I'm going that you're not seeing anything, so work with me. Um, I'm actually giving her a gift here. It's actually a small lamp that I thought would be very helpful for her to clip on to her songbook when she sings at night. However, as I learned um, in our first <laughs> ceremony, is that sometimes we need to uh, gently instruct our elders in the use of such things. Um, because at one point she was trying to clip the light on and it was just swinging around the room and everyone was getting flashed in the eyes and that's not a thing you want to happen when you're in a mushroom journey. So um, <laughs> it was it was really hilarious actually. We all just laughed our way through it. Um, hopefully you can see this. This is Wautla which is nestled up there in the Mazatec Sierra. Um, and here we have Maria Sabina at the entrance to Wautla. She is standing atop a mushroom which is what helps to um, welcome people. So right across from that sign that you could not read is Maria, which you can barely see, standing at, on top of a mushroom in her traditional garb, welcoming people to Wautla, or at least we like to think so. Um, let's see, I'm wondering what else we can try here. We're about as bright as we can be. I wonder if we make it, that's gonna do anything, not so much. Okay, surrender. Um, this is a beautiful picture of Maria. We had the pleasure of visiting her home and also visiting her grave. And um, I think that this picture helps to capture some of the essence of both the beauty in her spirit and the struggle that she went through. So after she did help introduce the Western world to the um, existence of this continuation of the use of the sacred mushroom, uh, her town was overrun with visitors and some of whom were welcome and some of whom were not. And um, it, it is said by some that the mushrooms lost their power. And some people were very mean to Maria Sabina. Her house was burned. Uh, there were ways in which she was tormented because she was open and interested in sharing with others about the, the magic and the mystery of the mushroom tradition. So these are photos that were inside of her home. Um, there she is holding a bunch of mushrooms in her hand. Uh, this is uh, Valentina and R. Gordon, R. Gordon Wasson. They're a couple. Valentina was from Russia, and uh, Gordon Wasson was an Anglo-Saxon New York banker. Uh, somehow they ended up together, <coughs> and they had a big difference in opinions. Um, sh there were many times um, described in Wasson's writings where he and his wife were walking through the forest, and Valentina would go running towards a patch of mushrooms and was so excited about these things that he considered these like disgusting, you know, toadstools. Like, oh my God. And, he, and what he came to understand is that, you know, often our upbringing, our environment, our culture shapes the way that we perceive things in the world. And so his wife was raised to see mushrooms as food, as medicine, and he was raised to think of them as just these filthy, disgusting things. So he opened his mind. 
and he started gaining an interest in mushrooms. And <clears throat> he and his wife became what they described themselves as ethnomycologists. They wanted to study this difference of opinions, this difference of interest, and this difference in use of mushrooms around the world. <clears throat> and so they did. They started to study mushrooms all over the world. This is a painting from uh, the caves in Tassili and the, um, some of the highlands of northern Africa. And what we have depicted here is a shaman <clears throat> with the head of a bee with mushrooms growing out of him or her or them. Um, and I've had a conversation with Paul Stamets about the importance of mushrooms to bees. So I just made this connection as I was putting this talk together this week, like, whoa, were these people really clued into this on a whole other level that, you know, in conversation with Paul Stamets, I'm just putting together. Um, so Paul Stamets and I were having a conversation about how he observed one day bees in his yard um, eating into a batch of um, mycelium that was growing um, under these wood chips. So he was experimenting with different ways to grow different types of edible fungi. And he noticed one day that these bees were working extra hard to push aside these wood chips to get to the mycelium. And they started eating mycelium, and then he started doing some research, and he found out that uh, there's actually a substance in <clears throat> mycelium that helps to regulate the expression of an enzyme and um, a gene, and therefore an enzyme and a substance called p-cumaric acid in the bees that helps to prevent colony collapse. So when bees have access to mycelium, they are found to prevent colony collapse. So there's this very interesting link between bees eating pieces, you know, mycelium, part of the mushroom that we don't see, the underground, the hidden web, and then healing their colony. So we know that, you know, colony collapse is a big deal, right? Bees go away, food goes away, we perish. Um, so I just want to bring that in. Um, these are some of the mushroom stones that were found. Uh, a lot of them have been found in the, the high sierras of Guatemala, but you can find them all throughout Mesoamerica. Um, <clears throat> they have different effigies typically carved on them. And this, some of the ones that uh, Paul Stamets and I had a conversation around, he said date back to 3500 BC. So that's a long time ago that people were carving um, mushrooms into stones. And so Paul and I had this conversation too, you know, if you imagine, we're seeing these stones in a format much different than the way they originally were. He said, you know, imagine these painted in various colors and perhaps under the influence of mushrooms, you're sitting with these stones by a fire and you're watching the fire flicker on these colored stones and maybe they're telling you a story or they're imparting some wisdom. So um, just wanted to add that in there. So Gordon Watson and his wife, so they're studying mushrooms all over the world. They're very interested and then they get wind that there is this mushroom cult still alive in the high mountains of the Mazatec land. <clears throat> so Gordon Wasson makes his way down there in 1953, tries to see if he can sort out a way to be invited in to do mushroom ceremonies, meets Maria Sabina. Two years later, she invites him to do a velada, which is the traditional um, nighttime mushroom ceremony. And he has his first experience on June 29th, 1955, being what he has said called be mushroomed. Um, so he goes into a state, and you can read about his experiences. Um, this is Maria by her altar, um, where, which would be part of the space where she would hold a velada. Um, and you might find things on the altar, such as images of the, the Guadalupana. Um, it's hard to see that there, but that is the, the Guadalupana, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Um, this is a type of candle that is hand-dipped from the bee, beeswax that is collected there in Wautla. Um, <coughs> might also see cloths like this that are hand-woven, um, or hand-embroidered, excuse me, by the women there in Wautla. So a lot of attention to <coughs> the importance of the mushroom. Also on the altar in front of me, um, in the gourd are some cacao beans, raw cacao beans. Those are given as an offering to the gods when consuming mushrooms. And the mushrooms are also served with a bit of honey, which is, so this is a very traditional Mazatec way to serve with some cacao and some honey. The honey is also seen as an offering and also helps to give us some energy. Also makes the mushrooms a little bit more palatable. Um, and then the cacao also to sustain energy and to be offerings to the gods. Um, also on the altar in front here is some copal. Copal is a resin of a tree. Um, different types of trees all over the world produce a sap that solidifies somewhat and is called copal. Um, and so the people there collect that and that is um, burned throughout the night as a way of cleansing and helping to send prayers up 
um, in the midst of the ceremony. So Gordon Wasson had this opportunity to sit with Maria Sabina and he wrote about that and it was published in Life magazine in 1957. Um, and unfortunately, much to his chagrin, the, the, t the article was titled Seeking the Magic Mushroom. So he didn't really like that at all, um, but that's what happened. And so that's where we get the name, the magic mushroom from. Um, you know, I consider them magic too, but I can understand where that on some level almost devalues what they really are because they're medicine. Um, okay, this is Albert Hoffman with Gordon Wasson uh, later on in life. So Gordon Wasson, wrote to Albert Hoffman, said, hey, I've had this experience, da da da, maybe I could send you some samples, maybe you can help me figure out like what's in these mushrooms. So um, Albert Hoffman does that, he uh, isolates psilocybin and eventually finds a way to synthesize it and then sends that back in pill form, believe it or not, with Gordon Wasson to Maria Sabina. She takes it, she says, yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I wanna show this slide, this is, um, uh, used with permission, um, thanks to Kat Harrison, who is the um, former wife of Terence McKenna, um, and who was, you know, part of this whole revolution of psychedelic medicine and healing. She and Terence brought ayahuasca to Hawaii. Um, they spent a lot of time in Wotla de Jimenez, um, studying with different elders and teachers there. And Kat put this uh, slide together as a way of helping us to consider the migration of the magic mushroom um, so and, and some of the cultural context. So down here in Wautla, this is not considered a drug. We have um, the importance of the role of ritual, an expert or a shaman or a curandero or a curandera to help us um, to navigate that world. There's a spiritual presence. We have the concept of supplication, seeing the way forward, the removing of obstacles, the restoring of harmony and gratitude. Um, eventually, enough people visit in the 50s and 60s that the mushroom migrates its way over to uh, the West Coast here, um, where it is seen as a natural drug, also a change agent. It has a Dionysian quality to it. It helps with the inspiration of creative, wild, and free culture in the 60s. Sometimes it is seen as unpredictable. It is still revered as sacred, and there is still gratitude for it. Um, extract the psilocybin and we bring it over to Johns Hopkins here in uh, Maryland and it is seen as a, a helpful drug. It's not technically a natural drug anymore although you could argue that all things come from nature. It is shown to heal trauma and end-of-life anxiety. It helps people to have mystical experiences to have different regard for themselves, to look at relationships a little bit differently, helps people to accept mortality, thereby appreciate their life and have gratitude. And then, you know, it goes on, there's psilocybin research happening all over the world now. So I'm really uh, grateful to Kat for letting me use this slide and, and to continue examining this. You know, this is just three ways, you know, three way conversation, but there's, you know, kind of infinite ways that this conversation's happening now. There I am standing, that sign says Santuario Maria Sabina. We're standing um, out, f out front of a museum, sort of, kind of a little store, but sort of a museum, next to her home, which is a little bit up the hill. We were on our way this day up to the holy mountain there for the Mazatec people called um, Cerro de um, Adoración, or Chico Nindo. And so we're en route to Cerro de Adoración here and of course on the way we have a cross and a little shrine and this is kind of the path from whence we came. Hard to see I realize. Um, here we have a pajarito. This is a little baby mushroom that's growing. Um, you know, uh, This is one of my teachers. This is her hand and she's pointing it out to us. So this is a little guardian. We, we kind of saw it as a little guardian saying, okay, yes, you can go up the mountain and you know, be mindful. And so we put some cocoa beans down, cacao beans down and um, made some offerings to this little friend that was guarding our way. And here's the path leading up to the um, kind of final summit there of Chico Nindo. So Chico Nindo is not only a place, but also an idea that there is this force. Chico Nindo is seen as a force that helps to unite the other mountains, particularly the unification of the feminine and the masculine aspects. And it's also seen as this power place for the Mazatec people. People make um, pilgrimage there uh, and, and go to pay homage. And it's also um, considered to be the place from which the force that animates the mushrooms comes from. And so, appropriately, we went up to make some offerings and um, to pay some homage. So 
What, what's hard to see here is that there's this one amazing, beautiful tree growing up at the top there. Here we have a shrine to the Guadalupana, and then we have crosses, of course, and then down over here are some of these little candles burning that other people had left behind and offerings of cocoa beans. And so we, we made some offerings and said some prayers and wrapped up feathers into little pieces of um, paper from a particular tree and tucked those in all around the hill. And I had a really powerful, mystical, magical experience up there. I was standing kind of off to the right of all of this, and I looked down, and there was a blue feather on the ground. And I was like, whoa. And I picked it up, and <clears throat> instantly felt really blessed by the presence of one of my early teachers. When I was in college and first coming to understand that I had an interest in natural healing and Native American studies and crystals and all these things, I had um, a teacher who was a Native American man that I would meet with once a week and somehow got college credit for this. Um, and his spirit guide was Blue Feather. And so I just was like so touched. I'm like, oh my God, here I am like early on in this trip. And you know, this I took that as a sign that uh, these teachers, though they're not in physical form anymore, were definitely there with me and, and looking out for me on this journey. So that was really nice. Um, so again, these candles are used in ceremony. There's always uh, 13 candles on the altar, and they are meant to symbolize the 13 layers of consciousness from the uh, from the Aztecs. Um, so this is a painting um, alongside a gazebo in the center of Huautla de Jimenez. So uh, one of the, th the take-home messages from this experience is just how integrated the mushroom is into everyday culture there. It is not a big deal, and it is a really big deal. Okay, so it's a bit of both. Um, these are also some images um, throughout um, on, on each side of the gazebo. So here we have um, children, their third eyes are highlighted, and we can see that there's mushrooms growing out of the heart. So mushrooms are literally at the artistic and spiritual and physical um, heart of the culture, really. Um, here we have um, an image of a man who's got uh, mushrooms growing out of his body. Um, and one way to think of this is mushrooms as the great composters. So if we think about what they do in nature, they break down dead decaying material into elemental particles and minerals and you know, raw carbon. And what we can do once we have elemental particles is we can build new things. So we can break down old structures, we can break down old ways of being, disease processes, whether they're physical, psycho-spiritual, mental, emotional, and we can be left with the elementary particles with the help of the mushroom and build something new. So that's one way that I think a lot about the mushroom work is as these great composters or decomposers. Um, okay, so on June 29th, 2015, we had our third ceremony with Julieta. And what occurred to us was that we were sitting with her on the 60th anniversary of the first time that Gordon Wasson sat with Maria Sabina. And it was a powerful night, to say the least. Um, and we told Julieta about this, and she was just so excited and so really wanted to honor Maria Sabina that we went the next day to Maria Sabina's grave. And it's a little hard to see, I apologize, but we took cloths and flowers and water and we washed her whole grave down and we left offerings of fresh flowers and um, cacao beans and San Pedro which we'll talk about in a moment and we said some prayers around there and we just really wanted to honor her for her life and for the gifts that have been given to us and so many other people that have had the opportunity to experience the psilocybin mushrooms granted they do grow all over the world and there are other cultures that value them but this is um, really the place that opened it up to many of us. So we wanted to honor her, and, and some of you that were in Mexico this summer, I know are in the audience, and you can feel the, resonate with the power of this experience. Um, Aquí reposan los restos de una mujer mazateca que con su sabiduría fue admirada por propios y extraños. So here lie the remains of a Mazatec woman who with her healing, um, her healing knowledge, her healing way, was admired by people close and far. So people of her town and from far, far away. That's on her grave there. And 
this is a little difficult to see, but what I want you to see is there's a cross here in the middle and there's a big fat mushroom on the outside. So this is at the top of her grave. So again, this blending of Christianity, Catholicism with the mushroom culture, it's just, it's seamless there. Um, you know, uh, this, the, the mushroom um, tradition was able to, it was widely spread throughout Mesoamerica. However, it was, um, you know, suppressed by the conquistadores, but it was difficult to get to Huautla. It's still difficult to get to Huautla. So imagine what it was like, you know, 500 years ago, let alone, you know, it's still hard now. Um, so this, this culture was isolated and able to perpetuate itself and stay alive and vital. And then eventually when Catholicism made it there, um, as many cultures did, they tried to amalgamate. So not to completely lose their origin, but to kind of hide to some degree. If you think about the Yoruba tradition from West Africa, and Santeria, you have other examples of how Christianity or um, other religions helped to blend with indigenous traditions that still kept some elements of the indigenous tradition alive, but kept them from being slaughtered by saying, oh, sure, okay, God is, you know, three people in one, and we'll practice Jesus as the sun, all that. Um, so, and, but it's it's here, it's present, and it's the mushroom that's actually on the outside encasing everything. So I just think that's kind of interesting and beautiful. Um, let's see. How about... Uh, oh, this is beautiful. So this was uh, on a random plastic bottle that was hanging on a fence by Maria Sabina's grave. Um, en la vida hay dos cosas que te mueven, tus sueños y el agua. In life, there are two things that move you, your dreams and water. I thought that was a real beautiful, uh, symbolic thing there. Um, this is um, a church, a chapel, uh, to the Virgen de los Remedios, the Virgin of the Remedies, or the Healing. She's a virgin that's revered in other parts of Mexico. Um, with the writing up above here, this is um, in Mazatec. So here throughout the land, we hear people, a lot of people only speak Mazatec or other dialects of uh, local languages. Um, so there, sometimes there's people in town, you know, it's, unless if you speak Mazatec or start learning it, it's gonna be challenging to communicate with them. A lot of people speak Mazatec and Spanish. Very, I never heard English spoken there, um, except maybe once or twice by, um, an artisan that I was buying like feather earrings from or something. Maybe he spoke a few words of English, but I speak Spanish pretty well, so it was a lot easier to just communicate in Spanish. And then I tried my best to learn a few words in Mazatec too, how to say thank you and please and hello and things like that. So that's always nice. Um, so here we're at the Chapel of the Virgin of the Remedies. And sure enough, painted right there on the side of the church is a good old basket of mushrooms, because why not? Um, I think these are San Isidros, which is a particular... Uh, mushroom that grows there and grows in lots of parts of the world. So again, just to show you just how integrated uh, these pieces of the culture are, and this for me um, was, was a very healing aspect of being there. Um, this is San Pedro, which is um, a tobacco plant. It has these beautiful pink flowers. It's planted all over in Huautla and other parts of the world too. Um, and it is, it is seen as a protector. So when it's planted, um, at your garden or at your doorstep. Um, I'll bring another picture of it up and let's see if that's any better. You know, it's hard to see, but there's beautiful pink flowers here. Um, it's seen as this protector plant, this guardian, and it's also used in ceremony. So the fresh leaves are taken and ground with a bit of cal or lime and also with garlic. And, the, and that San Pedro is then applied in ceremony, um, sometimes to, usually to the arms, to the inside of the elbows and down the arm and to the wrists and the palms of the hands and often on the belly as well. It's sometimes also applied to other parts of the body where there might be pain or discomfort and it's, it's, it helps to open energy. So it's not, it, it does it in a protecting way. So it protects the space, but also helps energy to flow. Um, and so this, we use this in ceremony and it's growing all over the place. And um, I had a really big healing about it on my last day there. Um, I was in, back in Oaxaca City and I was by myself and I was walking around town and I went into this big, big old church in the center of town. I don't always go into churches. I have a lot of wounding about being raised a Catholic and kind of ran screaming away from it at some point. But I got a big healing from this experience. I walked into the church and I was walking around and I was very impressed to actually hear a priest giving a sermon about um, levels of consciousness and ecological consciousness and I was like, wow, okay, this is good. And then I looked up and I saw San Pedro. This is St. Peter. 
and he stands at the gates of heaven and he's a protector spirit and i had this like really beautiful healing in that moment um for myself around wow how could i have how can i have some appreciation for the catholic re religion that i was raised in that even though i choose not to practice it anymore there's there's valuable lessons in there. There are things that I'm appreciative of. And how can I see you know, this saint as also a plant, as a protector, as a healer? So it was a really big, um, beautiful part of, of healing for me. And, um, and also just bearing witness to these ceremonies with Julieta. Everything's so seamless. It's just like there's n the mushrooms are so incorporated into daily life that it's just... It is a big deal and it's not a big deal. So for example, sometimes in ceremony, like um, a little child would come down, a little grandson or a granddaughter would just come in and you know maybe ask their mom a question or come jump on grandma's lap for a little while or something like that. And that is um, in a lot of ceremonial holdings here in the US that I've heard of, um, that's a big no-no. We don't have people interrupting, nobody knocks on the door, you better have your cell phone off. But there, Speaking of, um, but there it's like the phone rings and Julieta goes and answers the phone in the middle of ceremony. I mean, it's just like life goes on. The mushrooms are happening, the work is being done, and life is going on all around it. It's all seamlessly interwoven, and that's just really beautiful. Um, so I want to just say thank you. There I am. Oh, you can't even see it. But that's me standing with my arms outstretched in front of Maria Sabina. And uh, we can just put that one up because it's really pretty. Thank you so much.